many of you, when going to an amusement park as a child, remember going into one of those house of mirrors. You know where the mirrors distort your image? Well, of course you with your friends probably laughed at all the funny things that came out of those distortions. There was a boy, Rocky Dennis, who actually was born disfigured. I forget exactly what the condition was, but when he went with his friends to a house of mirrors, he saw himself for the first time, along with his friends, looking rather normal. Perspective. When things are changed or transfigured, we can get a different perspective. Just a few weeks ago, I was traveling with my brother. He had never been to the Grand Canyon, and I had been years ago. And when we got up early in the morning to see the sunrise over the canyon, typically when we travel, we take an early morning walk and pray the rosary together. Well, that morning we said he was speechless looking at the magnificence of this creation and we decided we'll pray the rosary a little later. Right now we can't speak. He was transfigured at that moment and so was I at the glory of this marvel of creation. I imagine most of us can point to a moment where we have a transfiguring experience. For some of you it was the birth of your child. For others it might be the burial of a loved one. Maybe it was that moment you saw your bride coming down the aisle at your wedding. Maybe it was the first time you went on top the Sandia. I remember Father Thomas had arrived in the year when we had more snow than we knew what to do with in the city. In fact, it shut the city down. But I took him on top. He had never seen snow in southern India. And I took him on top of the Sandia. We took the tram to the top, and he practically sank into the snow, uh, and all I could see was his head. <laughs> Don't take another step, Father. <laughs> but that was a transfiguring moment to see the magnificence of the mountain completely covered in snow. When Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the top of Mount Tabor, and they were there, the cloud had covered in the night, much like it was this morning as I was walking early and saw the cloud covering the mountain, and then the sun trying to peek out. That was what happened to his apostles. But it wasn't the natural sun. It was the supernatural sun, the Son of God, whose glory began to peek out of him. And they were so stunned at this moment, this transfiguring moment, Peter, who always had his mouth open, um, he says, well, let me make tents, you know, for you and Elijah and Moses. And he doesn't realize this. You can't make tents for the Spirit, okay? It's not possible. And then Elijah and Moses, who represent the prophets and the law of God, then disappear. They go back into eternity. And then what remains is the face of Jesus Christ. No, you're not going to make tents. And we'd like to make tents when we have those transfiguring moments, wouldn't we? We, we don't want it to end, right? But they have to go down the mountain. They have to go back into the world. And they have to take what they have experienced as a motivation to bring the divine light of Christ into the world. Just like all those young people, perhaps a million of them, last night in Eucharistic adoration in the great field by the sea in the city of Lisbon, including our own pilgrims that are there, 
and then this morning at Mass, you could hear a pin drop, if you watched any of it, as our Lord was exposed before the crowd of a million young people, teenagers who just a few hours before with the music and the dancing and the singing and the enthusiasm looked like a pep rally. Now, when Christ was exposed, you could hear a pin drop. It was a transfiguring moment for them before our Savior. What then do we do as we face the hardships that come to us in life? You know, the famous French violin maker said that the best wood for a violin comes from the north side of the tree. Why? Because the north side faces the hardest, harshest weather and is the strongest wood possible. Another great composer by the name of George Friedrich Handel, who gave us my favorite oratorio, The Messiah, actually, when he was composing the Hallelujah Chorus, the highlight of The Messiah, he had just experienced paralysis in his right hand and his right side. So how do you write the musical notes for the Hallelujah Chorus? Somehow he did it and gave us one of the greatest works in music. Speaking of musicians, did you know that Beethoven grew up in a large family and his father was an alcoholic? And so they had a very hard time growing up. And when he was 28 years old, Beethoven went deaf. And he wrote the Ninth Symphony, perhaps his greatest or one of his greatest works. And in writing it, he never ever got to hear it on earth nor could he hear the thunderous applause after the first performance was completed. And yet he continued in his great work. And finally, I think of a great artist by the name of Jean-Francois Millet. His greatest work, I believe, is called The Angelus, which of course is particularly important to us as members of the Church of the Annunciation. The Angelus is the prayer about the Annunciation, right? Angelus Domini non te abit Maria. That's where we get the word. The angel declared unto Mary. And Millet, when he was painting in the middle 1800s in France, France had gone through the French Revolution, the church had been decimated, people suffered tremendously. And a lot of the artists were, you know, doing paintings of Napoleon and doing paintings of the revolution. And he was the painter who painted ordinary people's lives. The people when they would come in, for example, from working in the fields. And the Angelus was set in the fields in southern France, a man and a woman. He has a hoe and I forget what she's holding, but they have their heads bowed because it was time to pray the Angelus. There's a great tradition, you pray it at six in the morning, 12 noon, and 6 p.m. And from looking at the scene, it appears to me it's probably the 6 p.m. as the sun is setting, and they're finishing their work of the day. The two of them have their heads bowed in prayer. Millet had just written this. We have only enough fuel for a few days and they won't give us any more unless we can scrape together the money. So this great painter had not yet become famous, couldn't pay the bills, and didn't have fuel for heat. So he was painting with his hands shaking because of the cold, and yet gave us his greatest work, the Angelus. I share these things because many times we think, well, my life is too hard. You know, it's not as easy as the person over here. It's always pointing. You don't know what that person's going through. It all might like look real sunny and shiny. You don't know the suffering that that person's going through. 
right? And you know your suffering and you say, well, I can't do anymore. It's not possible. No, it's too much. And Peter, James, and John might well have said the same. Peter had to leave his business behind. He had a very good, prosperous fishing business, right? Had to leave it behind and follow Jesus. What about James? James is going to be the one who's going to take the gospel to the farthest west known at the time, a place called the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, where all those young people are right now. That was his mission. And oh, by the way, he was going to be the first of the apostles to be beheaded. When he goes back to Jerusalem for the conference that they held, the first synod, if you will, or council of the church, they take him out and kill him. And what about John? Little John, Jesus' favorite. He was the youngest, right? And so he had special concern for him to raise him up as a leader. John is the one who then would have to take care of Jesus' mother. Can you imagine being responsible for that? Right? The mother of God? Yeah, you're going to take care of her when I go. So all of them had enormous challenges ahead of them. And yet, they remembered the transfigured glory of Christ, which strengthened them to get through the cross. What is the strength that you have been given? It is the same Jesus Christ, who has been crucified and also raised from the dead. Do we meditate on that? Think on those transfiguring moments in your life in order that you might be strengthened for the mission that is ahead of you. In the first reading from the book of Daniel, a prophecy was given about the Son of Man, one like a Son of Man, who appears before the one called the Ancient of Days. And this prophecy, we be believe, is fulfilled in Jesus Christ because it's exactly quoted in the New Testament, referring to our Lord. And Jesus will come again at the end of time in all of his glory in order to bring vindication to his believers and followers and judgment on this world. I conclude with a poem of James Hayes called The Transfiguration. He seeks the mountains where the olives grow, the Lord of glory veiled in humble guise. His soul is shadowed with a coming woe. The grief of all the world is in his eyes. His spirit struggles in the dark caress of anguish, pain, and utter loneliness. He always loved the mountaintops, for there, away from earth, he treads the mystic ways and sees the vision of the fairest fair. As heaven dawns upon his raptured gaze, the loneliness, the pain, and the grief depart. Surpassing gladness fills his sacred heart. That day, he stood upon the olive hill, and Peter, James, and John in wonder saw the burning glories of the Godhead fill his soul with grandeur. And in holy awe, they fell upon the ground and cried for grace, lest they should die beholding God's own face. As minor chords that sob from strings of gold the master speaks in accents sweet and sad. The vision passed, the chosen three behold, no one but Jesus, and their souls are glad.